It's a big help. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we're going to start Garcia Marquez's Of Love and Other Demons today, this nice, fairly short novel, as novels by Garcia Marquez go. Uh, see, not so, not so fat. Um, some of you will have read A Hundred Years of Solitude. Some of you will have read his great masterpiece, Love in the Time of Cholera, two, two novels with love in the title. But this one we're interested in is Of Love and Other Demons. Um, Garcia Marquez is a Colombian writer. He's lived in Mexico City for about 25 years, maybe 30. Uh, he's very much settled there, but he writes about Colombia. And um, this is his most set novel, in my view. If you've read A Hundred Years of Solitude, you know it's about Colombia, but it never mentions the word Colombia. This is a little different. We know we're in Cartagena. Look at your map, if you will, please, and you will see that Cartagena is on the Caribbean coast of Colombia. Colombia at the top of Latin America, as you know, is of South America. Panama used to be a part. We know that from Galeano. Uh, Pan Panama used to be a part of Colombia. The U.S. annexed uh, well, effectively annexed that part of Colombia in 1903 in order to build the Panama Canal. But that's neither here nor there. We know that Colombia has both a Caribbean coast above <laughs> Panama on this side and a Pacific coast. There, the coastal areas of Colombia are largely Afro-American or African-American or uh, black. That is a part of the remnants of a vast slave trade with Africa. Cartagena is a coastal town and it was the slave trading center for South America. The culture is very much uh, influenced by that and we're now in the 18th century. So this is late colonial Colombia or New Granada as it was then called. And so we have a kind of time frame. We have a historical setting um, in the past. We're not going to really move up into the present at all in this novel. So let's think of this as a historical novel in the rather usual sense of the term historical novel. So far we've seen Galeano and we've seen Fuentes and those are really odd historical slash literary pieces. I choose them at the outset because they combine literature and history in funny ways. This one doesn't. This one is what we might expect. It's set in the past and we get the trappings of a late colonial decadent culture with different kinds of people here and there. We're going to hear a lot about social class. There's an interesting paper, in fact, up on your website about the social classes that are reflect reflected here. And we certainly get a lot about the African subculture, if you want, or perhaps it's actually the European that is the subculture by this point. Unfortunately, Europeans are in charge, as is the church, and that's what happens, and it happens very badly at the end of this novel. I wouldn't say this is a happy ending to this novel, but let's start from the beginning then. We have our setting. We know it's late 18th century because Garcia Marquez wants us to know that. How does he want us to know that? He gives us a, some, some hints. In the library of the doctor, the Portuguese Jew who has fled the Inquisition and is living in Cartagena, we know some books in his, his library by Voltaire. He likes, he likes music by Scarlatti. So all we have to do is look up Voltaire's dates which we've done. I'll give them to you, 1694 to 1778. That happens to be the reference. It's a teeny little reference on page 113. I w wouldn't expect you necessarily to notice it. We have also reference to Domenico Scarlatti on page 36. His dates are about the same, 1685 to 1757. So we know we're in the 1700s toward, toward the end of the colonial period. And you just sense that you, if you've been to Cartagena, it's right on the water. It's exceedingly hot. It's one of those great walled cities that we've read about those in Fuentes always subject to pirate attacks and so huge walls that you can walk around to this day. It's a very beautiful city and beautifully taken care of now. But so let's, t I won't make us go to those page numbers just to say that we know the setting and we know the, the date and we're not going to stray from those places or that place and those uh, dates. 
except in the foreword. And we're going to look at that now if you don't mind. It's page three, it's right after the title page, and it's in parentheses. And it's a note that is given to us that starts with the date 1949. Now, wait a minute, this isn't the colonial period and this isn't the 18th century. Look at the end of that note, it's signed 1994. So Garcia Marquez, in the sort of putting on the mask of his own face, as it were, he's, this is an author's note. And he's telling us how he came to write this book. He's giving us this note in 1994, which is the date of the publication of the book, but he's remembering back to his own past in 1949 when he was a journalist, which is very well known. He began his career as a journalist on the coast, the Colombian coast. And he says that he goes to a, the old convent of Santa Clara. That's in the first paragraph. And he doesn't say that that convent is in, of Santa Clara is in Cartagena, but it is. You can look it up and it, you find that to be the case. Um, and he says that he is sent to cover the closing, if you want, the tearing down of this colonial monument of the Clarissan nuns. If anybody's interested in the Clarissans, they're the female Franciscan. St. Clara was St. Saint Francis's female counterpart. It's a nun. Uh, a, a convent devoted to poverty, as you wouldn't be surprised to hear if they're the female Franciscans, but anyway, we don't need to get into that. What happens? T uh, turn the page and he starts to say, oh, now they've gotten to the crypt. That's the place where they bury the important people of the town. And we get a stone in the middle of the second paragraph down, the Marquis de Casalduero we're going to read about because he's going to give him a fictional life but apparently a historical figure. The very bottom of that paragraph we're told, let's read that sentence, the foreman attached no importance to this. They had their, it was not unusual for an American-born aristocrat to have prepared his own tomb and be buried in another. This American-born aristocrat is the translation in English for the word criollo, C-R-I-O-L-L-O, -L -L -O, criollo. The hierarchy is that if you're a Spaniard born in Spain, you're fine. If you're a Spaniard born in the New World, you're already a lesser social class. This was the way that Spain controlled the colonies. They sent new people all the time. New bureaucrats for the monarchy, new church people, because they wanted them to be loyal to Spain, not to Colombia. So this criollo, criollo that we're going to see is a Spaniard born in the New World. It's not a mixed race. It's not word Creole, which we use in English to mean Louisiana food, which does in a way mean mixture. Uh, here, Criollo means a certain social class. We're going to see this guy in the novel. He's really uh, very much a decadent fellow, the father of our heroine, of our main character. And then we get to that Next paragraph, the surprise lay in the third niche of the high altar on the side where the Gospels were kept. The stone shattered at the first blow of the pickaxe and a stream of living hair, the intense color of copper spilled out of the crypt. The foreman, with the help of the laborers, attempted to uncover all the hair, and the more they, of it they brought out, the longer and more abundant it seemed, until at last the final strands appeared still attached to the skull of the young girl. Now, we're supposed to believe this. We're supposed to say, oh, yeah, that often happens. It's a journalist telling us about this experience that he had. We can decide how much we want to believe, but the novel asks us to believe this story of the torrents of hair that we're going to hear about all throughout the novel. Nothing else remained in the niche except for a few small scattered bones and on the dress stone eaten away by saltpeter only a given name with no surnames was legi legible. Sierva Maria de Todos Los Angeles. Sierva Maria is how she's going to be called in the novel and it means your servant Maria or servant of Maria basically. Um, in any case there's her first long name, long first name. Spread out on the floor, the splendid hair measured 22 meters, 11 centimeters. The impassive foreman explained that human hair grew a centimeter a month after death, and so this didn't seem so long. And then what the next sentence, which I'm interested in, starts on 
top of page five. I, on the other hand, did not think it so trivial a matter. For when I was a boy, my grandmother had told me the legend of a little 12-year-old marquise with hair that trailed behind her like a bridal train, who had died of rabies caused by a dog bite and was venerated in the towns along the Caribbean coast for the many miracles she had performed. The idea that the two might be hers was my news item for the day and the origin of this book. Okay, so he tells us what she dies from. Rabies. That's what he says. The whole book, the whole novel is going to be a question of how on earth she died and why. The difference between the fact and the fictional uh, version of this little saint's story. She's not a saint. She's venerated along the coast for the miracle she performed. So she's not an official saint. I'm going to argue to you and show you some pictures that she's a kind of Mary Magdalene figure. Mary Magdalene, all we've shown with her long copper hair and so forth. But for now, let's just say we've gotten this kind of preface. 20th century, late 20th century note about an earlier 20th century event that we're now going to hear about in a fictional context. Okay, so what, what do we do with all this? We start in chapter one with this possibility of rabies. We hear there's a rabid dog around. The dog is killed and hung in the uh, market. It strikes me, correct me if that's wrong, but there's, there is definitely the possibility that she has a dog bite on her ankle that is rabid. What happens, we find out from the doctor in the novel, do we not, that this isn't the way rabies behaves, that she probably doesn't have rabies because it would have popped up earlier than that. So then we're given to think that perhaps she is possessed of the devil because of the way she acts. This is just the plot summary. I'm doing it for you. I could ask you to do it too. And then the church gets involved. And possession is a very, taken very seriously. Any of you who studied colonial American history, you know the, the witches of Salem. If you read those testimonies, the women, who were mainly women, who were possessed of demons, believed they were possessed. They felt the devil had chosen them for reasons that they didn't understand. They asked, why me? But they never said, no, no, it's not me. I'm just fine. What, I was just acting weird yesterday. There is a real sense that the devil is abroad and a huge danger. So the Inquisition and what goes on in the Clarissan Monastery, that were, no, 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 is it the Clarissan? No, it's not, it's another. Yeah, no, of course it is the Clarissan uh, Monastery. All of this torturing, what seems to us, this exorcism, as it's called officially, that goes on. We can be cynical as 20th century and 21st century uh, inhabitants, but one has to see that some of the characters in this novel are quite serious about saving this girl soul, saving her from this possession that's occurred perhaps for no reason of her own. But now let me ask you a few questions. So what we know is she's interned and what we know is it ends badly. Um, we're going to look at it a little more closely than that. But let me ask you about how you feel about this whole question. It seems to me this whole novel is constantly worrying the question of why. It's giving us this luxurious, decadent world of Cartagena at this time. But other than that, and more importantly, the main question seems to be why she dies. Why she dies. The novel ends with her death, the fine, and we ends with her hair, which has been shaved, growing back like bubbles gushing from her head. What about this whole question of why? I asked you to think about it on, on uh, earlier. Anybody want to suggest something or other, Lexi? I haven't heard from you much this semester. Did you get to the end of the novel? Tell me what you think about it. Are you willing to say she died of love, as we're told at the end of the novel, or are there other things going on here? Well, I might not remember correctly, but she had said she'd been told she would die after she saw snow. Is that right. right. And so she had had a dream that she had seen the snow, and um, I don't know, 
when she does die, she ha she's kind of re living that dream in her head. Yeah, that dream comes back three times, and we remember her lover, who's the priest, Caetano Delora, has the dream as well, or, or has the vision. I think his isn't a dream so much, but he has had he's actually seen that in Spain, this f snowy field. Well, do people die of dreams? Do you take this to be a magical, real novel then, that people actually die when they see something in a dream that's predicted? predicted or? I think that if someone believes so, so much so that they will die after they see something, I mean, the mind is such a powerful thing that I think it could happen. And in this case, you know, she, I made a point about the grapes. Um, in the other dream, she was eating the grapes and they would grow back. But in this last one, before she yeah. died, she was eating them as fast as she could to try to keep, she wanted to die. She felt as though it was... Right. And her lover, well, Delora, did not return, so yeah. she just... She and furthermore, the by then, her, her physical situation is pretty disastrous, isn't it? Because <coughs> in an effort to dispossess her, to, to have her demons cast out, she's been badly treated. So, okay, so that's a possibility. That, but then, in that way, you have to say that the dream is the signal for her death after all of these other things have made her want to die or have caused her to die. In the, okay, so we're, so that dream is important. I want to look at that. I, I think that's interesting. Yeah, Jenny, did you want to add to that? Well, I was just going to say what you just said. I feel like from the point of when she got to the convent, she wanted to die. And nothing happened good for her there. I mean, they took her, her beads and they treated her really badly until those people came and they gave her like a new bed and mm -hmm. new pillows and everything. But then um, Delora, you know, he, he left and they were in love and I kind of felt like maybe if he hadn't left and they could have escaped together or something. That was what it, we kept hoping. We kept right. giving these hopes. We <clears throat> hope about the African priest or the priest who's been in Africa that right. he could help. Yeah. Well, and I think that since he left, she was like, well, there's nothing to live for. And then they start the exorcism and they, like, put her on a stretcher and carry her into the wherever and shave her head and everything. And I personally, I would have wanted to die too. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think that it was just one of those this is the end, what's the point in living? Yeah. I'm just going to be... And I think she didn't want to end up like um, um, the woman who lived next to her. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, you know, stay there forever and That's be right. tortured. Yeah, right now her name escapes me. Dulce Maria, was that? Dulce something. Oh, okay. It was not Dulce then. Yeah. Dulce, Dulce Olivia, sorry, I didn't hear you. The, the acoustic in here, or am I going deaf? I'm not sure. Sorry, Dulce Olivia. Yeah. Um, other. Yeah, Martina is the the one. Yeah, is the neighbor who sweeps. Is, is the she's the other um, prison mate. She's in prison ah, for the okay. she, she murders. Ki yeah. She killed him. Right. Yeah, yeah. I thought you meant the, the lady who's sweeping constantly in a kind of fog. Yeah, no. No, I was just saying Dulce because you said Dulce, and Dulce Olivia is, is another this, character yeah, who sweet. was um, the Marquis's first love yeah. from the lunatic uh, place. Right. <laughs> 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 Sorry, yes, we have to get our, um, our characters straight. Thank you. Um, other comments about this whole issue of why, yeah, Lexi, push your button, will you? Another thing that I thought of was Father Aquino, the yes. priest towards the end who was brought in to Let's look at that. I see you're on a certain page. Would you tell us what page you're on? Um, I'm on 133. Yeah, 133. He actually comes in on page 132, I think is where he's introduced. Yeah. <laughs> and what about him? I was just thinking, you know, finally she, like, at the bottom of 132, where is it at? Um, she, it says uh, she recognized him as at once as an archangel of salvation, and she was not mistaken. And so, I mean, after he dies, an untimely death, that also kind of kills her hope. Yeah, you know, oh yeah, no, understood. she's a, definitely, and it's interesting, Garcia Marquez is playing with uh, our sympathies as readers, because he knows, you know, when this guy appears, we think, oh, thank goodness, here's somebody who can understand her, because what is the deal? She speaks, she's been raised by the African servants in her 
household. And so she speaks a bunch of different African languages. She's absolutely in between classes, in between races. She's sort of neither here nor there. And then you'll finally see someone, this Tomas de Aquino de Nar Narvaez, who seems like he's going to understand her, be able to control her, because she's a bit out of control. That's part of the issue, I think. But look what happens to him on 135. It's so interesting. Self-sustaining belief is what this is called. A culture believes or a person believes something, and then whatever happens works to confirm that belief, right? That's what this goes on, up, uh, what goes on here at 135. It's, let's see, who's going out to look for him, the sacristan, the priest's assistant. Look at the bottom of 134. I'm glad you brought this up, Lexi, because this guy is very important for our consideration of, guess what, syncretism and transculturation. This novel is, again, about that. Uh, bottom of 134. At four in the morning, the sacristan who lived a block away from the church began to ring the bell for mass. Before five o'clock, in view of the fact that the priest was late, the sacristan, or sacristan, I guess I should say, it's English, not Spanish, although in Spanish it's the same word, the sacristan looked for him in his room. He was not there or in the courtyard. The sacristan is the guy who works in the sacristy, which is the room beside the altar where the priests dress. So he's the assistant to the priest. He continued looking in the vicinity of the church for the priest sometimes visited nearby courtyards very early to, in the day to talk to the neighbors. He told the few parishioners who came to the church that there would be no mass because the priest was nowhere to be found. At 8 o'clock, when the sun already hot, the servant girl went to the cistern for water, and there was Father Aquino fly, floating on his back and wearing the breeches he had kept on when he, he kept on when he slept. It was a sad, widely mourned death and a mystery that was never solved, which the abbess proclaimed as definitive proof of demonic animosity toward her convent. So the abbess takes it as one more proof that the devil is abroad and so forth. So yeah, this very discouraging also for Sierra Maria. There's no question about it. Other comments about this character and how she's caught in the middle? Is it possible that the culture wants to put her away unconsciously for not obeying the rules of the society she's in? Yeah, Lisa. Well, I think your point uh, about her not being a part of either society, they, they make a point of saying that the the walk she took with her father right before he checked her in yeah. to the to the convent uh, that was her first time to ever be in society at all she had never seen mm -hmm. white society once I mean I can yeah. can you imagine I, I can't imagine the yeah. the contrast between a black servants quarters and the the elite society yeah. and how a white girl could live her entire life and you know be more comfortable speaking the language of the servants yeah. um, it, it, she would have been a shocking personality I yeah, think that's right I think. shocking and, to everybody who fits into a category that's right and she doesn't fit I mean we can say she does fit into the slave quarters. We're going to look at Dominga de Adviento another name that um, <laughs> we need to keep in mind her, her uh, what would you say, nanny, she fits in there except that she's white. So she doesn't. She can. In the end, her father, and her father debates putting her in the, the tr it's not that her father is cruel and says, okay, you're a fish out of water, we'll just toss you into this convent. But yes, her behavior's got to be understood, at least in part, in terms of this crossing over of or this, let's say, shock of cultures, and in part by um, her, her own inability, I'm sorry, by her inability to behave and other people's inability to accept somebody who's out of the, out of the norm. Yeah. Or understand that she, how she could have come to exist anyway. Yeah. I was just going to add in that um, maybe I have a conspiracy theory problem, mm -hmm. <laughs> but when I read the part about the abbess proclaimed as definitive proof, I read that as they had him killed, like that he was sort now, of. Where did you read this? The, the line that you're taught that we just last read on 135, the last line when it uh, it was a sad, widely I mourned see. death, a mystery uh, that was never solved. Yeah. I, I read that as sort of like somebody decided to get rid of Father yeah. Aquino because they wanted her to stay locked up. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a misreading. I don't think the abbess would bother to ha would ever 
have a priest knocked off to prove that she was <laughs> right. Thought, but it just sounds so mysterious the way he... Yeah, yeah, it is mysterious, and the abbess takes that to confirm her belief system, but I don't think we'd better read it that way. I think that, I, I rarely say that would be a wrong reading, but I think that would be wrong. Yeah, Julie. Well, she's manifested as such this horrible character that you you think she's capable of anything evil. Right. So I would understand how you would think that, but it's yeah, also interesting because so. Um, she, the abbess and the bishop have a very touchy relationship mm -hmm. and the, the abbess sees um, Sierra's presence at her convent as a direct insult to her and um, she does? Yes. yes. Does she? I've forgotten that part. As I would have thought that she, she's bothered by it, but why would it be an insult coming from the bishop? Because there it explains towards the beginning of the book that um, maybe a century earlier there was a feud between mm. um, the bishop, the uh, a previous bishop, mm -hmm. and the um, the Clarissian nuns. Uh, I think about a, a territorial dispute, um, right? And the nuns were driven out of the convent, and there was a cessat. Cessatio adivinis. Like yeah. They were not going to uh, offer religious services, and so there was just really bad blood. And um, but is that connected directly? Would you show me where that's connected? I'm very interested in that because I had forgotten that we are to take the abbess as a kind of she stands for the bad side of the <coughs> church. She's intolerant. She's mean spirited. On the contrary, the bishop and Caetano, we, we see as kind of sympathetic human beings. I want to look at what the bishop has to say at a certain point, but I'd forgotten that it's linked. Would you show me where that is? Sure, and I wasn't, I'm not saying that I agree that the abbess... No, I understand. Um, yeah. But I'm, I don't remember exactly where it is. It's towards the beginning, and he jumps around so much, each paragraph seems to... Um, yeah, there are short scenes in this novel, I think. That's true. Well, let's, let's leave that in abeyance for the moment. What we know... Yeah, Eli, did you have it? Yeah, I think it's the top of 66. Top of 66? Thank you. Hmm, what do you know? So that explains some of her, um, okay. It took 20 years, to, okay, top, is it that one that begins it took 20 years? took 20 years for tempers to cool and the dismantled convent to be restored to the Clarissans, but after a century, Josefa Miranda was still simmering in rancor. Okay. She inculcated the novice, novices with her animosity, nurtured it. Okay, thank you very much, both of you. That is a very important uh, link. Nurtured it in her will rather than her heart and embodied all responsibility for its existence in Bishop de Cáceres de y Virtudes and everything in any way related to him. Okay, so there's bad blood. That's exactly the way to put it. And we see her reaction, therefore, was predictable when she was told that the Marquis de Casalduero, by order of the bishop, had brought his 12-year-old daughter, who showed mortal symptoms of demonic possession, to the convent. She asked only one question, but does any such Marquis exist? Her query was doubly venomous because the affair had to do with the bishop and because she her query was doubly venomous because the affair had to do with the bishop and because she had always denied the legitimacy of American-born aristocrats whom she called gutter nobility. That whole class issue. So we've got a class issue, we've got a religious issue, a historical issue. Thank you. Very interesting. And then on page 133, you have the abbess saying, I have no interest in whether or not things go well for that unhappy creature. What I do beg of God is that she leave this convent at once. Yeah, we, we knew that she's not at all happy with the situation, but I'd forgotten there was a historical link for that reason. Yes, yeah. Um, her, I think she has one of my favorite lines in the entire novel, which is, or is it hers, just because... Um, it's the devil's business. Just because the devil says it doesn't mean it isn't true. Do you remember that line or something like that? We'll come to it. But um, she's quite a figure and a presence here at the outset. I think she says um, one is not to believe the devil even when he's speaking the truth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, we'll find that. That's one of my, my favorite lines. Um, all righty, let's see. So we've got all of this, but I guess I've sort of tipped my hand because I think my own feeling about um, this death is that it's a, it's a religious and a social and a racial matter. It's not a matter exactly of dying for love, though it, that's certainly part of it. We know that she was wildly in love, as is her lover, the, the, the priest. Do we ever know why he doesn't turn up again? Do we know why he abandons her in the prison? Would you push? They seal off the entrance that he's been sneaking in, and he loses his position. I don't remember the exact details, but he spends the remainder of his life at the leprosy hospital praying to contract leprosy. Yeah. And uh, he has no access to her at all. Yeah, in a way, he's the other tragic hero of this, or tr let's say, victim of the structure, isn't he? Because in part, he, he feels so guilty that he's fallen in love with this person whom he's desperately wanting to de-demonize, undemonize. He thinks he can do it. He believes deeply that he can help her. Yeah. I just wanted to, I found the passage that had contributed to my conspiracy theory. Okay, your conspiracy uh, theory. <laughs> which was um, also on page 168, I mean, I'm sorry, 68. Uh, okay, wait, let us get there. Sure. 68, 68, coming up. Okay. Sierra Maria sat down on the narrow bed looking at the iron bars on the reinforced door and this is how the servant found her when she brought a supper tray at five o'clock. The girl did not stir. The servant tried to remove her necklaces and Sierra Maria seized her by the wrist and forced her to let them go. In the acta of the convent which began to be recorded that night, the servant declared that a supernatural force had thrown her to the ground. And I just uh, sort of felt like all the time that they refer to the acta, uh, um, the abbess stands by it as if it's, you know, the absolute yeah. truth, but it, this passage seems to sort of belie the, the fact that um, they're, in my view, consciously stretching the, the facts. Yeah, yeah, and you would say that the servant declared that a supernatural force, you, right. it doesn't say that she was. Right, yeah, right, right. yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, I think as moderns, we're so used to thinking about trials and evidence and proof th that, I, I, again, I refer to the Salem witch trials, which were happening a century before these, the end of the 17th century, 1695, 1690s in there. And we think of these rational Puritans who begin to s start seeing demonic possession. There are all sorts now of books about that. Well, it was largely against women because there were some women who owned property and they, some of these happened to be the win women who were then, who then become do bewitched and the society has, can gain something from it. I mean, we look for the rational uh, responses to someone being thrown on the ground. Your rational one is that there's someone pretending that she's thrown on the ground or that the abbess is, the facts sort of get that muddy. the facts yeah. sort of snowball yeah. to, to to indicate that she's more unruly and misbehaved than yeah. she than she is, or that her misbehavior has no rational explanation, where somebody's grabbing at her necklaces and yeah. got her prisoner in a strange place seems like there might be that as part of the explanation right. yeah. for unruly behavior. Yeah. Okay, other comments about this? We're going to look at those necklaces in a minute, too, or if not in a minute, at least, <laughs> at least next time, because I'm going to make this argument that it's a sort of Mary Magdalene story in a way. Um, and Mary Magdalene is, one of her attributes is pearls. She wears pearls around her neck, and we identify her at least until she converts, at which point she throws her pearls on the ground. You'll see lots of pearls on the ground in the pictures I'm going to show you next time. I mentioned that I'm interested in the bishop, and I'm in, oh, yeah, Billy. It's just, just in general, overall, I've never really read um, a book from uh, a Spanish author or anything that was originally in Spanish uh, as a novel for in a literature class, not uh -huh. just like a mystery novel or anything, but it didn't have elements of magical realism in it, especially if it dealt with religion at all. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, I still haven't decided whether it's 
these things are happening or not, but it also seems like a Salem witch trial type atmosphere, where, like just a bunch of groupthink going on. With a bunch of what going? Groupthink, like yeah, yeah, if kind you of say, communal you say, you set say of beliefs it. that keeps getting reconfirmed no matter what. So through you believe so, oh. something, and then I see it, and I'm going to just add on to it because you already believe these things happen in the first place. Yeah. So well, it's that I much kind easier? Of that's, that's kind of how I read the abbess, that she's, yeah. um, let's say now, thank you, got her nose out of joint for lots of reasons, but I don't... I don't think that she's part of a conspiracy. I think she is reading the world according to the text she knows how to read. We all do that. And so I'm agreeing with you. I think. What, what was the, uh, the African priest named Father Aquinas? Uh, was it? Uh, Thomas Aquinas. Think of that. Thomas okay, that's Aquino. what it was. I yeah. thought it was Aquinas, but I couldn't remember. I thought I was thinking of Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. Well, that was his name. So they used his name, and mm -hmm. they used him to quote. The beginning of the book. Yeah, yeah, and th the real Thomas about, Aquinas, about the hair, 13th yeah. century theologian. Thank you. Let's go to the, the about hair, right? The the dedication is a uh, kind of almost funny. For the hair, it seems, is less concerned in the resurrection than other parts of the body. Thomas Aquinas was very interested in natural science, and I suppose there is something about hair continuing to grow, not meters and meters. I don't suppose. Yeah, apparently the fingernails as well, but now we're into morbid su subjects. Um, <laughs> it's the St. Thomas a quote that I love, and we were fl playing with it a minute ago, is on page 80. Now that, just let me digress, now that we've mentioned St. Thomas, um, it's he, uh, somehow, it's, it's the abbess, yes, who says this, but with St. Thomas as her guide, it's the la second to last paragraph on page 80. St. Thomas said it, and I will be guided by him, said the abbess. One must not believe demons even when they speak the truth. So St. Thomas here, who's the great, probably, well, he's the great um, theologian of the Counter-Reformation. So he lives from, let's say, something like 1212 to 1270-something. I'm not sure of his dates exactly, but it's 13th century. And uh, he's a Dominican, part of uh, the Dominican order, and he's the great theologian that three centuries later becomes the way of thinking about theology for the Catholic Counter-Reformation. So it's kind of perfect that he is the dedication, or his, the dedication comes from him, because this really is about the Catholic Counter-Reformation. This is about the Inquisition. This isn't the Inquisition. The Inquisition takes people whose beliefs may be off and sees just how off they are. This is another matter. This is the, the exorcism run by priests for the good of the person who is possessed. So, now, Billy, you were saying you hadn't, hadn't read another novel that's been translated into English by a Spanish writer, or what would, yeah, that just doesn't any, have to do with magical um, realism. Just anything that would have, that would be taught in a literature class, yeah. anything considered worthy of studying. Yeah. Almost everything was magical realism, or had some sort of Catholicism in it, or some sort of indigenous yeah. Uh, religious That's a good connotations yeah. in it somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, I totally agree with you. It's not that there aren't novels about cities and about you yeah. know businessmen and about nature and lots of other things, but Latin American culture is deeply Catholic, no matter whether their person is a believer or not. Just as in a way, I would go out on a limb and say about mainstream U.S. culture that it's deeply Protestant, whether you're Catholic, whether you're a non-believer. Cultures in the Americas were driven by religion, and so as and indigenous cultures were driven by religion. And so, if you don't understand, I think some of that. But now this seems like a, a nice challenge. Elena Garro, you're going to say see our. Uh, and Simon Bolivar, who's our next one, um, they, they aren't so much about religious belief. There, there are moments of magical realism in that that seems to be, as you say, a characteristic. So that's that's what I was getting at, whether it's, it has to, it, it's so much ingrained in the culture that like, for example, if you're reading one of these novels, any novel that has these elements to it, Someone's going to claim that they saw the boy flying overhead last night, or you know the owl was really the, you know la cu curandera or something, yeah, or yeah, you know it just be. and yeah, and yeah. everyone's going to believe it just because they they don't have to be religious or anything, but any just your indigenous, especially if it's 
in the Americas mm -hmm. because you have, like you said, the, the mixture of the cultures. Yeah. There's no matter what you are, what you believe, or if you're an atheist, it's it's part of your culture. Mm -hmm. And if somebody saw it, well, maybe they did. Yeah. And if you see yeah. something fishy, you don't know what it is, you're going to automatically assume, that, oh, that's like just like somebody's going to say that's a UFO yeah. when it was lights. Somebody could say that was the witch going by that, just because that's how they were raised. Yeah, yeah I, I guess I'm, I don't know about everybody and all the time, but let's say that there are deep-seated belief systems which may include such things as things about the body. I can tell you lots of stories when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in a village in Colombia about belief systems that had nothing to do with my sense of my my health or my bad health, but people say, oh my gosh, you've just done something, this is terrible. And I was very mean, I'd say, well, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be paralyzed because I was out riding my horse and then I came back and took a cold shower because, of course, there was no hot water. Um, and then some of my friends, I had a Girl Scout troop, and they would they came over after I had just done this terrible thing. I'd been out riding a hor my horse and I was hot, and I come back and I take a shower, and they're just terrified for me. You're going to get paralyzed, Doña Luisa. And I said, no, I'm not. And they said, oh, but you are. And I said, you know, if you had done that, you would get paralyzed because you believe that. But I don't believe I'm going to be paralyzed, so I don't think I will. And I didn't, luckily. If I had, <laughs> if I had first of all, I'd be paralyzed. And secondly, I, I would have been wrong. So now, what are we talking about here? We're talking a teeny bit about our culture, yours and mine, looking at another culture and the belief system we don't share we call superstition. Now we've got to be careful about that because we want to respect cultures. There's plenty of stuff that goes on in our culture that when a Mexican comes here would say, well that's just Americans for you. They think that you can explain everything rationally, that there's not a flying person right there when I see him and so forth. Yeah. Just one last thing, the reason I brought it up in the first place is because nine out of ten books, like I said, that I've read I've come to realize that you need to believe the magical realism. It's, it, you're like, really, did that happen or not? You, yes, that did happen. And if it didn't happen, that person does believe that it did happen. Yeah, it's not that's, people that's making right. things up. It's not, if, and if you take something like, oh my gosh, we're going into a fantasy novel. Is this science fiction? No, this is part of the story and it's happening. Yeah. But and the reason I brought it up is because this one, I just assume that these things were happening, and then yeah. it gets to the point where it's starting to say, no, maybe they're not. Yeah. And that's what was throwing me off in this book. Yeah. I think, though, Garcia Marquez is toying with you a little bit. He's toying with the reader a bit, because he gives us lots of reasons why this woman died. Starting with the, the non-fiction, supposedly non-fiction, of course it's a crafted, thought-through preface in italics saying she died of rabies. And then we see all of this cultural stuff, and then I guess we're asked to think about the indeterminacy of history. If you want to say it another way, I think this novel's a lot about how you write history. He gives us the small version, that's the historical one. If you want to think about the hows and the whys and how this person felt and what this was about, we're going to see it in next week's novel too with Simon Bolivar. We know the history of Simon Bolivar. Garcia Marquez cares about that history, but he cares about the life of this hero. This is, so, so in other words, I agree with you that you can't not enter into the novel. Any novel requires that you suspend your disbelief. That's, that's the phrase. You, you read a realistic novel by John Updike, and pretty soon you think these people, these characters, are, are more than the ink on the page. You think they have feelings, you think they have names, you think they drive certain kinds of cars, and so forth. But I, I do agree with you that the Latin American novel is more interested in what I would say it calls spirit or spirituality or belief systems than, and it's part of the reason I don't think I would teach this course the English English history through the English novel. Though you can learn plenty of history from the English novel. But it seems to me that the Latin American novel is very involved in trying to decide about its own history, about its own belief systems. So, yes, is the answer to your question. <laughs> Yours wasn't a question, but thank you. I, I, I think we need to keep, keep all of these belief system questions in, in, in mind. We are going to have to stop, so I'm going to stop here. I see our time is up. Um, please 
if you haven't finished the novel, do so. On Thursday, I'm very interested to pursue a number of these issues, the cultural issues. So we do have some sense of Cartagena in uh, this period of time. See you next time.